Yes, great. Okay. Great. Very good. Okay, um, we might as well get started right away. I'm John Regeer, and I'd like to introduce our next Ask Me Anything speaker, Bjarne Strustrup. He is um, the designer and original implementer of C++, so he's not going to need a huge amount of introduction, I don't think. Um, he's currently a technical fellow at Morgan Stanley and also a visiting professor at Columbia University. In 2018, Bjarne received the Draper Prize, the highest honor that is bestowed by the US um, National Academy of Engineering. Um, so before we get started, I just wanted to go through a couple of administrative things. So Bjarne, um, we can go a little long since we have the room later, if you are willing to and want to, or we sure. can stop after half an hour. Is that, it's, that, it's is that okay? I'll, I'm here for as long as you need me. Okay, we have, we have a bunch of questions, so, so, so that's great. Good. Okay, so let's see. So I'd just like to remind the audience that there is a dedicated Slack thread on which to post your questions. So don't post it in the general Ask Me Anything thread. Um, please post your name and affiliation along with your question. And I'll just apologize in advance for pronouncing names wrong. I'm sure that I'll, I'll, I'll butcher several of them. Okay, so let's get started with our first question. So the first question is asked by Jeroen Katema at ESI in the Netherlands. And the question is, I currently work with companies that have substantial C++ code bases to control the embedded systems that they market. This was a choice these companies made several decades ago, and the choice made sense at the time. If you would advise a company building an embedded system from scratch right now, would you advise them to use C++ or a different language, and why? Um, I'll probably advise C++ because I like it. It's efficient. It has a broad community to go with it. And it is far, far better than it was a couple of decades ago. OK. Our next question is from Marissa Kurosame at the University of Washington. If you could go back in time to 1979, what would you change about C++? Um, that's a time machine question. And we don't have a time machine. Um, one of the interesting aspects of uh, programming language design is that if you succeed, uh, you stick, you, you have what you did many, many dec uh, years and decades ago, and you have to live with it. Uh, once you get users, you have responsibilities, and one of the res responsibilities is not to break their code. And so stability becomes a major, major issue. So there's a few hundred billion lines of C++ out there, and we can't break them. We have tried to improve things. So the first rule of the game is, in reality, we, we can't use the, uh, the time machine uh, stuff because we don't have a time machine. Um, secondly, I think that there's few major things I would change. Um, partly because I can't, and partly because they worked. On the other hand, I can't think of any of the significant details of the language that I couldn't do better with retrospect, but I can't fix them. Um, I could do templates better. We're improving them with, uh, con uh, with, um, with concepts. Uh, I could do exceptions better, we're improving them. I could do the syntax better, that's not that hard. I knew it was trouble when I started. However, there was already a C community and I could spend my time teaching people how to write a for loop or I could provide a decent class concept. Uh, I couldn't do both, there wasn't a time for it. So all the details could change, but the fundamentals I think are fundamentally sane, fundamentally good. Um, C++, the way I see it, is, is a language with two parts. One part is to get to use hardware really well. That's a C part of it. And the other one is to get away from the hardware when you, when you need, when you want to, and when you don't need to fiddle with the hardware uh, all the time. I mean, fiddling with machine addresses, pointers, and, um, and, 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 and fixed memory, and uh, all of that kind of stuff is rather unpleasant and the mistakes are uh, dangerous and it's also not very productive. You need abstraction to get away from that. 
And we have, over the years, gotten better and better of abstraction to the point where we now can do very flexible, very safe, guaranteed, um, uh, correct um, abstractions. And that's actually pretty good. And those were the ideals. We have approximations to those ideals. Our approximations are improving with each standard. Uh, with each uh, major new language. I get a little bit sad when I hear people talk about C++ as if they were back in the 1980s or 1990s, which a lot of people do. They looked at it back in the dark ages and they haven't looked since. Uh, fortunately, I was lucky or uh, whatever. Um, I had a couple of ideas or fundamentally good, uh, which I started with. They weren't perfect and we couldn't do them right, but over years of evolution, uh, it has gotten uh, much closer to, to those ideals. Okay, thank you. So our next question is from Matt Jabinski, and this is not a language question, but a compiler question. It's, what do you think are the main areas where current C++ compilers could do better? Um, I have not looked at optimizations recently, and partly that's because they keep getting better. And today, I spend less time hand optimizing anything. I, I write the cleanest code I can, the fused indirections, the fused conditionals, and hope for the uh, compiler to do a good job of it. And you know, on average, they do. On the other hand, I work a bit with static analysis because there are things you can do with C++ code, like no dangling pointers, no memory corruption, no, um, no range errors, no null pointer dereferencing. We know how to do that. Furthermore, for a reasonable set of programs, very large sets of programs, we can check this statically. And so I'm interested in the static analyzers. And I would like to see much more work in static analysis working together with tool sets, uh, uh, rule sets. I, I work on something called the core guidelines project, where we are trying to set, uh, make a set of rules that people can apply to write modern C++ instead of um, old C++ uh, or C and C++ uh, mixed up uh, in, in ways. And so I suggest people look at what is good C++, how would you write it, what guarantees can you offer, and then write the static analyzers to provide uh, those guarantees as opposed to just promises by the programmers. And it can be done. Static analysis, especially local static analysis, is very important because the programs for which I'm interested in, in the, the guarantees, tend to be large. I am not um, academic enough to be interested in a static guarantee for a 100, 100 line program. I really would like my static guarantees to hold for million line programs and very especially for those static, for those embedded systems, the previous uh, question uh, uh, referred to, because I, I really do want my planes not to crash and my, uh, my brakes and the car to work. C++ is very deep in the um, self-driving cars and other car parts, and that kind of stuff should work. And if you write cruddy code, I get nervous, but you can do better. And the main piece that is missing in the picture of my view of what the C++ world should do is actually static guarantees. That's um, the, the uh, static analyzers, that compiler technology. Um, if you are good at analyzing programs, you can do a major contribution here. You can actually make C++ safe the way people talk about safe programs. There's a lot of that deployed already in uh, Visual Studio, but 
I would like it to work independently of the compiler. I'm not in a, uh, I'm, I'm in a GCC shop mostly, so that's where I would like it. If somebody could do a core guidelines, uh, lifetime and range checker for GCC, I'll be very happy. And it should work for a million line of code. Sure, good, good. Okay, our next question is from Ruji Zhao from Imperial College London. And the question is, I just read your recent review on C++ in the last 15 years. And I, I guess that's talking about the, the long um, thriving in a crowded and changing world paper. Yes. Um, and I became fascinated by the idea and history of concepts. It is promised to be a better alternative to C++ templates, but are there significant things that only templates can do that, that concepts cannot? Concepts are part of templates as far as I'm concerned. If you look, sorry, let, let me back off. That paper um, was written for Hubble, the History of Programming Languages Conference. I was supposed to be in London presenting it this Monday. I'm really annoyed with the um, uh, clue and the travel bans and such. I don't want to, didn't want to sit here in New York. I wanted to be in London and talking to the other language uh, people and be at your conference here. Anyway, that paper is a massive thing, really a monograph describing C++ in the last 15 years. And um, I'm, I'm grappling with the fact that why did it succeed? This was the period where Java and C Sharp was supposed to take over the world. And the our problems changed, our technologies changed, our hardware changed. So why did C++, the C++ community uh, grow by about a million and a half people in this period? And so I'm looking at sort of social things, evolutionary things, technical things, doing all of that. Um, let's see, what was the question again? Um, what can concepts uh, what could templates do that concepts can't? So basically, you go back uh, when I designed templates, I knew very well that you should be able to specify a template's requirements on its arguments. I mean, I, I know my theory and background. This was well known. Um, and I just couldn't do it. The Design and Evolution book from 94 spent three pages apologizing for me not solving that problem. And basically, so I wanted three things out of, uh, out of templates for generic programming. Um, I, I wanted very great freedom of expression, very great good generality. I wanted performance comparable to a hand-coded uh, C straight on the machine. And I wanted um, basic type safety. And Given the time, the technology, the knowledge, I got two out of three. And I've spent the next 20 years trying to figure out how do you get all three. But I see concepts as an integral part of templates. It was the third thing that I wanted, and now I've gotten it. Uh, I've gotten almost all of what I wanted. There's as usual a few, few details uh, that are not, in my opinion, quite right. But read the Hubble paper, it's massive, 168 pages. Only the JavaScript paper is longer. And I'm not sure length is a virtue here. Um, but read it, there's a story about how we got there. I, I like history. I like to know where things I deal with come from and why. Mm -hmm. It helps me use things. It helps me uh, basically be a better program, a better designer. So uh, I can recommend that. But it's not templates or concepts. It's the same thing. OK. Our next question is from Haobo Wan at Penn State University. C++ is a programming language with a long history. But today, more and more people from different fields will write codes at work. And they may want to use different, easier to use programming languages. Except for reputation. What does C, what does C++ do to, att to attract them? How, why should they use C++? Bigger community, better performance, greater flexibility. Um, that's, that's a pretty good start. 
uh, massive tool support, massive uh, libraries. It's there's it's it's just a good solid language. Furthermore, most languages come up and want to be C plus plus beaters, and people have tried that again and again. When you simplify a language to make it easier, you usually throw away something. Uh, when I want to throw away something, I really want to uh, do it by subsetting C++ to the bits I like. That's what the core guidelines uh, project is, is, is all about. Because we, we can't just throw away all the old history. There's lots of code out there. And furthermore, when you design a new language, everybody comes up and says, oh, this is better than C++. It's so much simpler. It's so much easier. And then one or two things happen. You fail because you can't get people to use your language. When you succeed and your language grows. Java is now three, four, five times more complex and larger than it was when it started out, claiming it was better than C++ because it was simpler. So you, you can grow or you can die. Um, it's, uh, you, 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 you can you pick your poison. Um, okay. The next question is from Juby Taneja at the University of Utah. What were the design goals for C++ when you first designed it in the 70s? And do you find C++ to serve the same goals today as, as well, or has it changed completely? Um, basically, please share your thoughts on the future of C++. Sure. Um, I've said something like this before, and I should say it again. I needed two things. I needed to do low-level programming. I needed to write memory managers, process schedulers, um, network, low-level network things. I needed really to manipulate that hardware. That's what I got from C. I don't want to do that all the time. I want to get away from the hardware. I want to write in nice type safe stuff. Okay, for higher level things, I went to Simula. Um, the origins of object-oriented programming. I got there with classes. I got there with a very flexible type system. And uh, those are the two bits, hardware access and uh, abstraction. C++ is much better at it today. And uh, I just wish people would use it more and understand it that more because a lot of people are stuck in the past. But in the future, I want even more of that. So for the hardware thing, I want better interfaces and better uses of say TPU, FPGAs um, and such. And hardware is getting easier to deal with there. Uh, uniform address spaces across TPUs and CPUs means that you can do the, the data movement easier and more implicit. Um, and for the abstraction things, just now, I think we should probably take it a little bit easy for a while um, to absorb the lessons of C++ 20. We got major new uh, facilities there. We got coroutines back, which actually is both an abstraction and a better use of hardware. I say got it back because that was the bread and butter for the first 10 years of C++, but then, Nobody believed they were that important, unfortunately, especially implementers at Sun. So we lost it. Now, now they are back and better than ever. But we have to learn how to use them. We need to have better um, library support. We have modules to radically improve our compile times. But we have to learn how to modularize our hardware, our software, so that we get the benefits and we interact with the build system and all of this kind of good stuff. So just now, if we could just in the next three years, just stabilize things and learn how to do things better, I'd be happy. Beyond that, um, we have a model for better concurrency coming up. Almost certainly will be in, in 23, it exists and it's used. It's backed by people like uh, Facebook and Nvidia and uh, Intel and such. So it, 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 that's where we are getting better concurrency, better use of hardware. So those three things I actually think we're going to get. Beyond that, I am looking at uh, functional style 
pattern matching. Um, I've been working on that for a long time. I proposed it for C++ 17. Um, maybe we'll get it for 23 or 26, but things move slowly when you're moving at really massive uh, community. And um, uh, so, so that's something I'm looking at. If we can get it right, I'd love it. Um, it gives better type safety, uh, terse expression of ideas, and all the kind of good stuff. And the other thing I'd like for is uh, static reflection. We can't afford dynamic reflection in a lot of areas with C++. Uh, some people can afford it, some people can't. Uh, if you need twice as much memory because you have to have enough stuff to do a runtime reflection, a lot of C++ users either is, uh, become infeasible or they become too costly so that you have to have more hardware and we can't afford that. So static reflection is the idea that at compile time, you look at the code you're generating and then generate some other code. I mean, the ideal is to say, I want to have um, a JSON out of these types. At compile time, you generate the optimal program for, for, for JSON uh, reading and writing. Um, that's a standard example. And we have proposal from that. There's work from that. Um, we might get it in 23. People would like to get it in 23. I'm not sure we can get it. Um, the time is it's getting tight and the world is in a strange state just now. But those are the, the major directions I'm seeing the, the language go in on a longer term that is beyond talking about standard releases. I really would like more support for distributed computing. Uh, this was how I got into it in the first place. I wanted to build what would have been the first Unix cluster if I had uh, managed to finish it instead of getting distracted by C++. Um, and um, I would, would like to see support in the language or in the libraries for actually communicating with uh, large groups of computers and cores and such. We're, we're, we're pretty good at multi-core, multi-threading, uh, that kind of stuff. But I'd like to get to not shared memory. Um, anyway, that's that, That's my personal uh, sort of hobby horse. Has been for a long time. OK. Our next question is from Matthew Francis Landau. It seems that the current direction of C++ changes is increasingly going towards compile time code execution. The path C++ has taken resulted in many different approaches to this problem, such as templates, constant expressions, meta classes. Do you think that in hindsight, it would have been better to have taken a metaprogramming approach from the start and develop all other features on top of metaprogramming? In other words, do you think that forcing developers to contort their code in order to get the features they want, for example, boost before C++11, was the right direction for the earlier years of C++? And what benefits do you think have been included in C++ as a result of this approach? Um, I'm not a great fan of template metaprogramming. Um, it is ugly, complicated, and so useful that same people will do it despite its uh, problems. So what I would like to do is actually to replace the ugly and complicated parts of template metaprogramming with something simpler. And the something simpler is generic programming mostly. Concepts is part of that. You can do proper type checking of your arguments. You can work on the requirements. You can overload on requirements so that you can have two different functions uh, based on requirements. You could extend that to classes. If you read some of my research, it's your papers. You could actually define classes depending on, on um, on, on, on requirements. Uh, and the other thing is that I really like, if you want to calculate a value, you should call a function. You shouldn't generate a type that indirectly gets you to there. So uh, I reckon I can probably eliminate maybe three quarters or more of all template metaprogramming with concepts and context, but 
and uh, improvements in the compile time evaluation that's not based on type manipulation with, uh, uh, with, with template metaprogramming uh, will help a lot. I think you'll find that in C++20 what's offered there uh, you can do much of what people do that horribly complicated stuff with. Now if I could have invented concepts in 88 when I was doing it, we would have been better off today. Um, if I could have gotten people to accept const expo, which is basically pure functions that, is evalu that can be evaluated at compile time. Um, when I first proposed them, we would have been better off. I, uh, together with Gabby Does Rays, had it all worked out. Um, somewhere in 2005, maybe, maybe thereabouts. And when it came to the uh, standards committee, that was actually one of the hardest things to get in. People claimed they were not only useless, they were also unimplementable, which is pretty amazing since just about everything depends on it now. But simplify it and uh, make it more regular. Okay. Thanks. My next question is from Anki Chowan, who's an alum of the University of Texas at Dallas. Anki is curious if you have any particular favorites among programming languages and any particular reasons for your for your picks. Oh dear. Um, when I get that kind of question, I always waffle. Uh, very deliberately so, because it is so easy to get quoted out of uh, context. Uh, I actually like programming languages in the plural. Um, when I did C++, I knew maybe 25. Now I know probably more like 50. But I'm not going to, to pick favorites um, beyond C++, of course, um, because it can so easily get misinterpreted and it can so easily, uh, people can pick the wrong reasons and such. I like lots of languages. It would not be a nice world if we only had one language uh, that everybody had to fit into, because I don't believe that there is or could be a perfect uh, programming language, at least not in the time scale we're talking about, a few decades or a hundred years, maybe, may, maybe in a hundred years, but not in my lifetime. Okay, our next question is about, is about safety. It's by Emmanuel Lima, University of Sao Paulo. Do you think that RAII, smart pointers, and other modern C++ concepts are enough to produce memory safe code? And if not, in your opinion, what else could C++ as a language or C++ compilers do to improve safety? Oh, wonderful question. Um, go use the uh, core guidelines, especially uh, where we describe the, um, the memory safety and, um, and, and range safety profiles. Uh, RAII takes care of uh, resources, um, the checking of the uh, rules for, for memory and pointer use takes care of the, uh, the memory safety, can be done, has been done. We need to get it out wider. We need to get it um, uh, in, in yeah, we need to get in wider use. We have to make sure that all the compilers can do it. And we need to get the static analysis that we're using perfect. I, I have not tried it hard enough, but I have rarely found a system I couldn't break. So um, we, we probably need more work there and we need scaling work. Uh, as I said earlier, I want this kind of stuff to work for the... Uh, million line code where it's most useful and for the safety critical things. But yes, we're almost there. Um, I have one particular problem which has to do with um, how can you actually use this stuff easily. And that is we need to separate access from ownership. And so that you can have access cycles, uh, but you can't have ownership cycles. If you want to use RAII, don't have cycles. It, it just doesn't work. But your systems are much, much better if you don't have them anyway. If you have shared pointers or garbage collection, you have to have cycle detection. It's much better if you don't have a cycle. 
It's the same reason that I'm uh, not fundamentally against garbage collectors, except that uh, they shouldn't be needed. You shouldn't create garbage. And that's the fundamental uh, way we're addressing this stuff with the core guidelines and the C++ in general. And um, so if you do that, you get something like the STL, you don't put pointers in there. By default, you put the object in there. You get a copy. And therefore, the ownership is vested with the... Um, with, 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 with the container and you can set accessors out to be used and if you reallocate inside there you invalidate them. It's one of the invalidation is one of the things a static analysis can handle. Now I would like to have that slightly more generalized. I want to be able to write easily a general graph with graph algorithms so that the graph owns the objects and accesses come in and you deal with invalidation and such. I'm working on some of that and I'll probably uh, pop, uh, put something out in the public in the next half year or so. But that's the interesting question. How, if you're using RAII and safe pointers, do you write a completely flexible, completely efficient general graph? Okay, our next question might be a very, very easy one for you. This is by Roy Margolit from Tel Aviv University. Which programming language do you use for your personal projects and why? Um, mostly C++ actually, um, plus whatever scripting I need. Um, and the rest is not so much projects, it's just poking at it to see if I understand what it is. Uh, project is probably too fancy a word for it experiments okay. and that's that that's that tends to be a different language every year the next question is an, another one from matt jabinski what advice would you give to current c programmers for effectively learning how to make the most of c 20 and what are the best ways of staying up to date with further developments to c i think the best thing is try not to be at the bleeding edge of everything. Um, experiment with bits and pieces. Uh, don't try and be too advanced. Uh, try to use the language uh, better, simpler. Remember that there's a maintenance guy coming after you uh, for, for real code. And yeah, don't try and be on the bleeding edge except for your personal uh, tests. Um, Look at the core guidelines, contribute to them if you can. Um, they are already sort of modern. They're, they're sort of at 14, 17 thing. Um, if you are not up uh, to, to, to modern thing, I recommend a tour of C++, which gets you up to somewhere between 17 and 20. Um, as an overview, and then find areas you can poke at. Uh, the CPP con and um, meeting C++ videos are good, but in my opinion, they, they tend to err on the side of showing really clever stuff. And when I'm in maintenance mode, I don't like really clever stuff. Um, I, I want to, to be able to understand it reasonably easy, and uh, understand the problem, understand the general solution, not get lost in say template metaprogramming details. Okay, our next question is from Piyush Kushwaha from IIT Delhi. Do you think there's another modern must have language feature that you would retrofit onto another widespread existing language as you did with object orientation to C? Um, Excuse me, T in five minutes. Sorry. Um, if you're looking at really major things, they don't come very often. There was 
classes and then class hierarchies that came in the package of object-oriented programming from Simula. And that was what I merged with the C. And then I've been looking ever since on, um, on generic programming. And we got some metaprogramming out of that and we get more metaprogramming with Constexpert. But that's another big thing there. Uh, RAII is absolutely fundamental and people don't usually mention it, but it did come in the first week of the work with C with classes. This is the real rock bottom of uh, C++. I did two things in the first month. Well, two and a half. I took the classes, but to get them to work, I needed uh, what became known as RAII, constructors and destructors, and I put in uh, function argument type checking, uh, which we now have in, even in C. Um, but that's that's a rock bottom. Now, going beyond that, there's the whole space of concurrency, which is not very well defined. And there's many, many kinds of concurrency, many, many kinds of parallelism. And we, we need to get a better hold of this. This has been true for at least 50 years. So it's not going to sort of get itself solved completely next year, but that's an area to look into. If, if you want to look at what can be done in a major part, uh, integrate FPGAs, GPUs, and CPUs in a nice programming model. I don't think it's possible, but as close as we can get, there's this old joke about the, the mathematician proves something is, un, uh, is impossible and the engineer does it. The engineer cheats. He does 99% of the problem and make sure you don't fall into the last 1%. It's close enough. And so things, solutions like that can be done. Uh, for minor, for, in, in this huge picture, functional programming pattern matching and uh, static reflection are minor things, but those are the two things I mentioned before they are on our list of things that we would like for C++ 23 or, or, um, or, 20, uh, or, or 26. Uh, but but they're, they're, they're big, but they're not uh, changing like object-oriented programming or generic programming. Okay. Our next question is from Anna Zhang at MIT. Relating to above questions on what you would change or redesign about C++, do you have any reflections on about how those changes would compare with languages, with, with things with the, that Go or Rust have tried? Um, I think C++ can do anything Rust can do, and I would like it to be much simpler to use. In particular, I experimented back 15 years ago with um, linear logic and uh, unique pointers, the idea of if you wanted to do something with an object, you pass the pointer, the pointer over there, and then you return it back again when you're finished. And I decided that it was not uh, realistic for the kind of things I wanted to do. Um, it was just too clumsy. It uh, carried overhead for simple um, algorithms like in C++, when you want something done with an algorithm, you usually pa pass a bunch of pointers or iterators or something like that, and they come back again. And the fact that it's an ordinary function call and the thing come back again means that I, have to, I don't have to be explicit about transferring ownership. Just because you're going to do a job doesn't mean I have to transfer the ownership. I have to transfer the right for you to use it. And that's the model I would like to do. I think it is simpler. And uh, so the way I'm doing things that Rust are doing is uh, through the guidelines, through the static checkers, and I want a simpler programming model that's closer to the uh, current classical model because it actually has uh, a lot of virtues. 
Okay, next, um, Numera Menser at MPI SWS asks, what are you working on nowadays? What am I working on, uh, on nowadays? Um, I have about three jobs. Um, my, my day job is, is working for the technical part of a bank. And there I mostly deal with, well, distributed systems, uh, networking, uh, get, get, getting data from A to B under various constraints. And I find that quite interesting. And uh, well, that was what my PhD was in. So I've been doing it ever since. Um, I also deal a little bit with um, performance issues. Um, I, I, when I was in academia, I thought I knew about performance because I could count microseconds. Now I have to count nanoseconds. And um, then I deal with large code bases and how can you make the, make large amount of codes reliable, maintainable, uh, bring them up to date with modern stuff. That's where the core guidelines come in, by the way which is a collaborative project. It's open source, lots of people take part. You can find it on GitHub and contribute. Um, then I, I give a course on design, software design every year at Columbia. And uh, then I try and look after the C++ uh, standard process where these days I'm mostly worried about direction. People are so excited about uh, C++ that we have 250 people turn up at standards meetings. And getting 250 people to agree to anything is, is very hard. And it's also relatively easy to get large crowds excited about something that's fashionable or new or something like that. And um, so I have to preach uh, stability and uh, careful progress and not overdoing complexity a lot, but uh, looking at the standards committee, um, you can get all the papers from the standards committee by typing WG21 into your uh, browser. That's the official name of the committee, WG21, and see what's going on. And you'll find I'm talking about direction a lot. Um, the other place to look at that, to get my view, the ones I'm trying to get into the committee and where I want the committee uh, to go if, if, if they are listening to me. Uh, that's that Hubble paper we talked about um, that's, uh, that's available from ACM and from my home, my home pages. Yeah, I've, um, I sometimes look at the WG21 agendas and it's, it's almost overwhelming the amount of material. I would uh, cut almost. Okay, our next question is from Benjamin Driscoll at UC. Uh, uh, it's, it's Sorry. Okay, our next question is from Benjamin Driscoll at the University of California, Berkeley. What is your opinion on the trade-offs of a mechanism along the lines of C++ epics, of the, of the C++ epics proposal as a means of cleaning up the language? Uh, I don't like epics. I don't think they work. I don't think they scale. Um, People will simply um, do whatever they want to do. Uh, that is, if you have epochs, you will have people who want their code in different epochs, and then they want code from different epochs uh, to come in place. Uh, I, I think it is a, a fundamentally flawed idea. Uh, we haven't even been able to, um, to get, get rid of things we decided really were bad because, you know, you want to take away a feature that's probably not a good idea and you find there's 200,000 people who rely on it and you can't force them out of that. Epochs assumes a degree of control that you don't have for a really widely successful language with multiple implementations, a large diverse tool industry. Um, I mean, what if I go to Epoch 3 and you're on Epoch 2 and your tool, does, the tool vendor decides that he wants to go with 4? I need to talk to your code. I need to use my tools. Oh, by the way, your tool vendor is still on 1. <laughs> this, this kind of stuff doesn't scale. 
Okay, our next question is from Ehud Nemad from Hebrew University, Jerusalem. What is your opinion on syntax extensions from within the language without the need for another preprocessor? Um, I tend not to like syntax extensions, um, usually for the reason that people like them. That is, they allow you to build your own language. It allows you to build your own uh, little world. And that's good for you, but I'll do exactly the same. And how can we now share things? All my best code uses extensions uh, that I have made that you don't have, same for you. And what are the odds that we overlap in some way, that there's some kind of syntax that is, uh, that, that, that clashes, it, it has ambiguities. What are the chances we've used the same keywords and things like that? That's, this is very hard. It's actually interesting. I was looking at embedding an LR1 parser in C++ back in about 83. And I decided chaos would erupt. Um, one of the reasons was I was looking at what people were doing with, with overloading. And I found that there was wide agreements about what people wanted to overload. They just couldn't agree of what it meant. The classical case was that some of my best friend wanted to overload star star to mean exponentiation. But one guy was an alcohol follower and one guy was a Fortran follower and those two languages had different priorities, uh, binding pr uh, strength of exponentiation. And therefore they each argued very strongly that it was important and what they had was incompatible. Had they had the syntax uh, support, had they uh, they just gone away, they would have gone away if done it. And if I looked at his program, it meant one thing. I looked at his program, it meant another thing. When we go further to the kind of things we want to do with static uh, reflection, the opportunities for creating incompatible extensions become much, much bigger. And I, there's, in C++, a lot of the problems comes not from not having something, but from having 20 of them. I mean, it's not that we don't have a GUI, it's that we've got about 25. It's, it's not that we don't have a graphics library, it's about 25. It's not that we don't have a database, we have 25. If I am a user, especially a beginning user, or if I want to start a new company, which of those 25 do I use? And if I want a GUI, a graphics library, and a database, I have to choose three times. This is a major, major problem. And I suspect that support for language extension that are too flexible uh, will increase that kind of problem. So this is not a direction I'm keen on going in. I know how to do it technically, but just because you can do it doesn't mean you have to. Okay, our next question is from Abirup Sarkar at Chalmers University. What's your opinion of modern system languages like Rust and their use of ownership types for resource management? And do you see parallels between RAII and ownership types? Um, I answered this before. Um, yes, I uh, think RAII allows you to have ownership type. I talk about owners like uh, vector and locks and uh, um, smart pointers, they're owners. We do that all the time. It's uh, been foundational in C++ uh, since the early days. It's highly humorous when some of the Rust people come up and accuse me of having stolen some of my, their ideas without acknowledging. When some of the things I did, I actually did almost 40 years ago. Um, and I looked at uh, linear logic, uh, ownership logic a long time ago. We're, we're going there. Um, but I think we can do better, making it easier to use, more efficient. Uh, that's fine. Uh, commenting on languages in general, I promised I would waffle and uh, I will try not to answer such questions because language comparisons are really, really hard if you want to do them honest. Uh, this is not just 
taking a, a couple of examples from, from academic papers and see which ones are better. You have to look at the community, you have to look at see how it scales, you have to see what kind of application areas you've got. One of the things I've learned over the years is you haven't a clue what a language is being used for. That is, once it spreads, it gets used for things that you wouldn't have imagined uh, was possible in ways you wouldn't have imagined it. So you have to have a little bit of humility because you don't know the answer. And when you try to compare languages, you usually pick some domain that you know well. But for me, in terms of C++, well, there will be 50 domains I don't know well. So which one do I pick? The one where my language looks best? That's what people usually do. And then they compare expert level use in one language, using the latest facilities and the best support, and they compare it to something that very often is a 10, 20 year old view of the other language. Um, using an older compiler, uh, forgetting uh, some of the advanced libraries. Those kind of comparisons are really hard, hard to do honest, and are not going there. It's, uh, I decided many years ago, it's beyond me. It, that would be a full-time job for somebody really good and really honest. Next question is Jean-Michel Gorius from ENS Ren. I've seen quite a few companies move away from the C++ standard library because it is considered inefficient. The reason for such a decision often boils down to things like small size optimizations for something like standard vector that would break the ABI. Do you think the C++ will one day allow itself to break the ABI or to provide a non-ABI stable version of the standard library that would be more open to change? Um, there's a couple of things there. Uh, First of all, most times I've seen people move away from the standard library, their reasons have been suspect. Um, quite often it has been bad use, misuse, um, or um, so, so they, they, they shouldn't have done it. Um, secondly, you don't actually have to use the standard implementation of a standard library. You can just tune your own. I've done that quite a few times. I'm actually doing it currently uh, for a project where I want something very much like the standard library. I want the standard library's programming model, but I can do the implementation better. I can do the implementation with constraints that uh, the standard library doesn't meet um, because it's a more particular system with particular rules, and I can't use the standard uh, library. But boy, my interfaces look just the same. And you can do that all the time. There's been lots of talks about breaking um, ABI compatibility uh, for, for things like getting a better hash table. Build your own hash table, you can do it. If you know how to do it better than the standard library, you can build your own table Call it hash map instead of um, uh, the, the standard one, or call it uh, the map and says, this is my implementation of the standard library. Pe people are just too keen on, on, on sort of very often going away and building their own thing because they're sure own thing is better. Their own thing might very well be better this year for their application. How do you know that it is better for your application next year when your application have changed a bit and the hardware has changed a bit and the optimizers have changed a bit? It is good to be patient with the standard because it tends to move with the, the hardware and the uses. And if not, build your own little version, use your own little version when your own little version gets outdated, which most of them do, if you're stuck fairly close to the standard interfaces, you can just upgrade. We used the Boost smart pointers for years. And in the many cases where the standard is now better, it was relatively easy to switch because we used the same kind of programming model, the same kind of interfaces. Interfaces are very important 
but they don't have to be ABIs unless you are sharing with some other code where you need it. And they don't have to be exactly the same, just as long as you can move from one to the other. Um, after five years, maybe when you need to upgrade. Okay, um, we're gonna have to give up this channel now because the next AMA is coming up and I'd like to thank you. This was, this was great, Bjarne. Um, very, very, very glad you could, you could be a part of this. And there are still remaining questions. Is there um, possibly another mechanism that we could ask them over um, or, or, or should, we just, should we just finish this now? And, uh, email them to me and I'll okay. see if I can answer them. Um, I used to be very fast and very reliable. I can't claim that anymore because well, you get busy. And uh, but I'll try. Okay, I'll I'll send you an email, and then we'll get the re we'll get your responses posted in the um, in the PLDI site somewhere. Thanks. Okay, thanks again.